If you are about to take or are currently taking an anatomy and physiology course, you are in the right place. You see, I've been an anatomy and physiology instructor for several years now, and I find that my students need to know these five things before setting foot in my class. And those who can get it first usually perform the best in my class. So I'm gonna share these tips with you today. This is Organized Biology, so let's get started with number one. How do we learn in the first place? Now you may already be shaking your head and being like, what does this guy know that I don't? But in reality, most people don't know how they actually learn. And what do we mean by learn? Well, normally we think of that as having concepts and information stored in what's called our long-term memory banks. And so the goal then is to take all these random ideas and concepts and put them together in here so that we can bring them out or recall them. And not only recall them, but actually explain what's happening and understand the concept fully but it doesn't always work really well. And let me prove that to you. At the beginning of this video, I actually held up three markers that were three separate colors. Can you tell me what colors they were in order? Chances are, unless you're a magician, you probably couldn't answer that unless you rewound and then was like, haha, I got you, Mr. Jackson. But in reality, most of our information that's coming into our brains at any moment is a part of what's called our working memory otherwise known as our sensory memory. This is our memory that hardly lasts a second. So most of the things you see and hear and smell on a moment by moment basis, you forget about immediately. And that's actually important because your brain filters out not important information, right? But here's the thing, you're about to go into a class where you deem this information important, right? You're going into the healthcare field. So you need to get the information that the instructor is presenting from your working memory all the way over here to your long-term memory. Now, how do we do that? That's a great question. Well, if I asked you the question, what's my profession? What do I do for a job? Well, hopefully you got that one right. I'm an instructor of anatomy and physiology. I've taught it for several years. And you knew that because you had taken that sensory information, that working memory, and you've actually encoded it into what's called short-term memory. And with short-term memory, you can remember these things or objects or numbers for about 30 seconds to several minutes before you forget it. So remember, what was the difference between the working memory where you forgot what markers I held up immediately to actually remembering what my job was? I drew attention to it, right? So when I said, I'm an anatomy and physiology instructor, you were like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. I don't want to listen to him. So by drawing your attention to that fact, you encoded that, you thought about it, you focused on it, and yet then you stored that in your short-term memory. So what was the key difference? Focused attention. And to be honest, the goal of your professors and instructors is to get information from working memory into your short-term memory by drawing attention to different concepts and ideas. But will that help you on the final exam? Absolutely not, because you're gonna forget most of this within minutes, which is very demoralizing for teachers like me. So the last question then is, how do we get information from our short-term memory, which has a pretty small box, as you can see, we forget it within minutes, and how do we finally get it into our long-term memory? Well, this occurs through a process called long-term potentiation. So to understand that, what I want you to do is think back to a very vivid memory of yours, or maybe just something you know really well. Maybe it's some sort of recipe, or maybe it's some sort of uh, event that happened in your family's past. And I want you to think about all the things you can remember from that recipe, event, or memory. Well, it's likely you remember names of people that were there. Uh, maybe for the recipe, you know the order and the ingredients involved. Maybe you know what it looks like, what it smells like, what it tastes like. Or perhaps in the memory, you remember the emotions of the moment, right? So thinking of all of those things, you can recall and explain those things because you've attached several different modalities to the same idea. Now, modalities is just a fancy education term that means different ways to encode the information. Things like visual stimuli, things like sensations, right? Taste, smell, uh, things like words and writing. So you're, you're taking all of this information and forming it into one thing, and that cements the memory so much better than just kind of focusing on a word for a split second. So to apply this to anatomy and physiology, which you're about to take, you need to think of how many different modalities can you use per concept, per organ system you're learning about. So this is where diagrams become vitally important, uh, watching YouTube videos, getting a different perspective on it, right, rewriting your notes, all those things are using different aspects of your brain so you can remember it better. And the second thing that accounts for long-term potentiation is what I just said, repetition, rewriting, going over things again. So think about the things you do every day, like brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, what have you. You don't even have to think about these things. You already know how to do them because you've done them a million times. And for me, when I teach about anatomy and physiology, I hardly have to think about it because I've gone over it so many times, it's like second nature. So your job as a student of anatomy and physiology is to repeat things on your own time, that's the hard part, so you can reinforce these ideas as you go. Now, a good professor will actually go through things multiple times in different ways, but some won't. So I want to prepare you to work to repeat. And there are other things, but the last one I want to point out with long-term potentiation is learning to teach. 
You see, I had a student who just received about 100% in my class. She got basically every extra credit point and she wrote on her evaluation. I went home every day and I told my family about it so much that they got annoyed at me and they basically had to change the topic anytime she brought up anatomy and physiology. But the thing is, since she was learning the information and then she had to teach the information, it forced her to cement that learning so well so that she can actually, boom, recall and explain it. And there were some times she went home and she had forgotten what she had learned that day. So she went back in her notes, repeated it, redrew the diagrams, and then was able to teach it to her family. So big picture, a lot of your information is going to be stored in the short-term memory by the time you leave class. Now your goal is to take that information that you were just presented with, and you need to repeat it, look at it in many ways, and then try your best to teach it to somebody else. And that will help you store it into long-term memory. Okay, now the hard part is over. Now let's talk specifically about how your anatomy and physio, how your anatomy and physiology, <laughs> how your anatomy and physiology class will be organized so you know what's gonna come before you step foot in the classroom. At the beginning of any anatomy and physiology course, the instructor will likely start with some sort of big overview of the human body. So you're gonna be talking about different anatomical terminology like anterior meaning front, posterior meaning back, as well as an overview of homeostasis, cell biology, chemistry, atoms and molecules, and whoa, what the heck is all that? I'm using a lot of terms, so let me actually diagram out how this course is going to be organized. So this is the general arc of the beginning of anatomy and physiology class. So we're starting with that body overview, homeostasis, atoms, molecules, chemistry, cell biology, and then you're going to start probably with the skin. Kind of random, right? And I agree. We need to put all this in a better organizational pattern. So let's do that here now. So in terms of a hierarchy, think of the smallest particle that your body is made of, and that's going to be an atom, right? Now, if we view the whole picture, right, that's going to be the human organism. So that's kind of delineated with the overview and then starting at atoms. But in between, we need to know how atoms build the next thing that builds the next thing that eventually builds the human organism. So let's cruise through that real quick. So we know that atoms, when they combine together, they make molecules. Things like water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc. When molecules get built together in big, big molecules, they're called macromolecules. Now these are proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Now put those together in the proper organizational structure, and you're going to have organelles. Which is one of my favorite words in a &P, which is a baby organ that builds, you know it, the cell. Now the reason I'm bracketing off cell is because cell is the functional unit of the human body. So if you're doing something, it's because your cells are doing something. And you have, drum roll please, 30 trillion human cells. <laughs> so as we're trying to understand the whole human body, you have to understand what these 30 trillion cells are doing so you can understand the bigger picture. So I hope that your professor goes through cell biology for a pretty good amount of time because that's the crux of everything. And if you don't have an instructor that does that, I highly recommend hopping over to my cell biology playlist, get an overview of everything before you step foot in the class. From there, we cluster cells together into their functional organization. So many cells working together for a common purpose is called a tissue. This unit will probably be confusing. I apologize in advance. But tissues then build a common thing that you've heard of before, which are organs. So you know some organs, right? Like the kidneys, the heart, the skin, etc. But most importantly, these organs work together to form what's called organ systems. These are things like the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the urinary system. And the reason I bracketed these out is because this is how the class will be most commonly taught. You see, most of the chapters of your textbook are going to follow different chapters based on specific organ systems. And if you want an overview of all the organ systems before you step foot in the class, go ahead and hop over here. And obviously you put all 11 organ systems together and you will build the human organism. Now here's where things get scary. In order to understand the organ systems that your professor is going to go through chapter by chapter, what else do you have to understand? Well, you have to understand organs and tissues and cells and organelles and macromolecules and molecules. You have to understand every level of organization in order to understand how the organ systems function. That seems redonkulous, ridiculous, crazy, right? And it is, and it is. But let me give you a few tips to help you piece together the connections between all of these. So this brings me to number three. What are the core concepts of anatomy and physiology? So these are ideas that are going to show up over and over and over again in your classes. Now, I'm not going to be able to get through them all in this video, so hop over here afterwards to get the full 10, but I'm going to go through three for you and show you how all that fits together in terms of this level of organization. So the core concepts I'm going to highlight here are... So here are the four I'm going to do. Homeostasis, high to low, blood is a river of life that goes to all your cells, and structure fits function. What the heck do these all mean? Well, let's say for example, your muscles are working out, you're exercising. Now in order for the muscles to contract properly, they need a very, very important molecule from the air called oxygen. 
And the more and more and more they work out, the less and less oxygen will actually be inside the muscles themselves. So there will be a very low amount of oxygen. Now that's a problem because if they don't get the oxygen, these cells will die and you will cease to move. So in order to properly feed this muscle cell, we need our bloodstream designated here to be filled with oxygen so we can deliver that oxygen to the muscles. And the value of oxygen that we require in the blood is somewhere around 98 partial pressure of oxygen, which is just a unit of measurement. Now, what is this 98 to 100? Well, this is what's called a homeostatic value. We must keep this number here to keep our cells adequately functioning. Now, the problem is, is this muscle is going to continue and continue taking oxygen from the blood and pulling it into itself. And the reason it does that is because there's such low oxygen in the muscles and there's such high oxygen in the blood that the oxygen will flow in its high concentration to its low concentration in the muscle, representing the second one, high to low. So the muscle's getting fed, but what did we do to our partial pressure of oxygen most likely? Well, we probably dropped it to say 90. And that's bad because we need to keep it at that 98 to 100. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, we need to follow the blood because the blood is a river of life that goes to every aspect of your body, every single one of those 30 trillion cells that I talked about earlier. So the blood's also going to go to a place called your lungs. And as you breathe in, there's a lot of oxygen in the air, so there's gonna be a lot of oxygen inside of the lungs. And remember, we have relatively low oxygen in the blood. So where does the oxygen wanna go? Well, obviously high to low, but there's a problem. There are barriers here. What are these little barriers that I'm showing? Well, these are cells, right? So if I were to zoom in on that, what we would actually see are several cells fit together in the lungs and several cells fit together lining the blood vessels. And so we're looking at cells, this level of organization, but we're also looking at tissues because we've got similar cells functioning together. Now, what's the goal here? Well, the goal here, once again, is to take that oxygen from high to low into the bloodstream so that we can feed our cells properly, right? Well, how are we gonna do this? Well, we see that these cells are super duper thin, right? They're structured so flat so that oxygen can easily pass through high to low, as we mentioned prior, into the bloodstream. So that's our last core concept represented, structure fits function. So since we get that oxygen back into the bloodstream, the bloodstream can go back to the muscle cells with plenty of oxygen and continue feeding them and feeding them which is another reason that when we exercise, we need to start breathing in faster and faster to get as much oxygen into our blood to feed our muscles as possible. Okay, so what did we talk about just now? Well, we talked about oxygen. Oxygen being a molecule, right? We also talked about cells and tissues, which are up in this level of organization. But this whole process of bringing oxygen in and using it for our cells is actually a part of the organ system called the respiratory system. And the way the blood is circulated is through the system called the cardiovascular system which represents our heart and our blood vessels. So both systems work together to achieve what we call homeostasis. And what was homeostasis in this case specifically? Oxygen levels in the blood. So when you're learning about these difficult concepts, what I want you to try to do is see if you can find these major players here. Hey, do you see cells in this diagram? Do you see some molecules, maybe some atoms in the diagram? Do you see some organs at play here like the lungs, right? They're all represented, but remember, they're represented in differing sizes and differing levels of organization. Great, now before we get on to number four, if you've been getting value from this video at all, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. I'll make continued content like this to benefit you as you take these healthcare courses and a courses. Now, number four is going to be medical terminology specifically prefixes and suffixes. Before I forget to say this, I'm going to link a big list of them in the description below so you can use that for free. But what are these in the first place? Well, we know that prefixes are basically beginnings of the word. So things like tropo or myo or even pre. These are beginnings of the word that mean specific things. Whereas suffixes are the ends of the words, things like ace or in or lift. So these may sound like gibberish to you, but they're going to show up over and over in your anatomy classes. So for example, there is something in your body called tropomyosin, where we're combining the two prefixes tropo and myo and ending it in in. Well, if you know what these three mean, we'll immediately know what the heck this is doing. So just to give you a little glimpse into that, we know that in usually refers to some sort of a protein, which is represented by macromolecules previously right about here. Myo refers to muscle. There's also things called myocytes that are literally muscle cells that I drew previously. And then tropa means acting upon or on top of. So put it all together and we have some sort of a protein that's acting upon or on top of a muscle, right? Now, if you wanna learn about this protein, I have a video about the sliding filament theory and how your muscles contract here. But just by getting a picture of these prefixes and suffixes, you already know kind of what we're talking about. So the more med terms you can learn before you enter the class, the better off you will be. And last but certainly not least, you won't learn everything. 
Yes, I said it. There is no way that you can learn every single thing you need to know about human anatomy and physiology in one or two classes. But that being said, I want you to embrace the challenge. So my uncle told me a story that will stick with me until the day I die. He's a cardiac surgeon, and he's very, very smart, smarter than me. And he told me about a colleague that he had who had studied a single protein. So one of those macromolecules, pretty low in the levels of organization, a single protein in the heart for 45 years. He studied this protein for 45 years, and he told my uncle, that they still don't know exactly how it works. They know a lot about it, but they still don't know the whole picture. So if that's just one protein out of the tens of thousands of them in your body, and those all build your cells and your organs, there's no way you're gonna learn every single aspect of this class by the time you walk out, or even after medical school, or even as a doctor. But what I would love for you to do is go back to what I talked about at the very beginning, small focused efforts on certain things that are that the professor is pointing out get really good at those try to draw connections between them using the core concepts that i've mentioned before using those prefixes and suffixes and you're going to be in great shape and before you go learn all the core concepts here